Hello, welcome to our Career Coach webinar, Supply Chain Careers Spotlight, Strategic Sourcing and Procurement. My name is Dana Day, and I am the Manager of Member Relations at ASCM. We are experiencing some technical difficulties, so please bear with us if we have a few hiccups as we begin today's webinar. Um, before I begin, I would like to run through a few other details. This presentation is being recorded and will be available at apix.org slash careercoach. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. If you look at the toolbar on your screen, you'll see a questions box. To ask your question at any time during the presentation, simply type it in the box and click send. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Rodney Apple. Rodney is the founder and president of SCM Talent Group, LLC, a national supply chain recruiting and executive search firm that recruits across the end-to-end -end supply chain discipline. Rodney has specialized in professional and executive supply chain recruitment for two decades and has a wealth of knowledge and experiences that he generously shares with our ASCM audience. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Rodney Apple. Rodney, you may begin. Thank you, Dana, and thanks for everyone that has taken the time to join our webinar today. Uh, we are taking a different approach, uh, having uh, have had the Career Coach program for five plus years now. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to the different fields um, and careers that exist within uh, the end-to-end -end supply chain, and we're going to start out with uh, a career spotlight on the strategic sourcing and procurement uh, field, and I have a guest panelist that I'll be introducing here in a moment. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the agenda. So quick introductions, uh, we'll get into how you can access um, ASCM Career Coach uh, Resource Library and all the materials that we've developed over the last five plus years. Kind of an overview of strategic sourcing and procurement, get into some of the core skills needed, and then we're going to talk about the various career paths that exist some of the challenges that are ongoing uh, right now within uh, the field of sourcing and procurement, as well as some trends. Uh, we'll get into a panelist discussion with Stephen Hester, who is a chief procurement officer. Got a couple of announcements from ASCM that Dana will provide, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. So we'll get started. Quick introduction, uh, again, Rodney Apple. <clears throat> I've been in supply chain recruitment for about 20 years, half that time with some large corporations, four corporations, uh, all have made the Gartner top 25 list multiple times each, uh, built the first supply chain department for the Home Depot, and then moved into Coca-Cola for almost seven years, leading all aspects of their supply chain recruitment. Uh, that includes uh, their that strategic. Includes okay, I think that's gone. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, and then uh, wrapped up with Kimberly Clark on the healthcare product side, CPG, and then Cummins uh, Automotive. Uh, filled over a thousand different positions within all aspects of supply chain manage management and uh, looking forward to uh, speaking about the procurement space. Uh, here is a link to access the Career Coach webinars and white papers. You can see we've covered a plethora of topics as it relates to professional development and just go to that link there. You'll need to log in with your, uh, your uh, credentials in order to access and download uh, the materials. Uh, you can also find plenty of professional development content inside of the SCM Now uh, magazine. Uh, the latest issue came out, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, and um, I just submitted my latest article today. So there's plenty of good information there as well. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Stephen Hester. Stephen, you want to give uh, the audience a, just a quick uh, overview of your background as it relates to procurement and, and, and sourcing? <clears throat> Be happy to, Rodney. So, hello to everyone. My name is Stephen Hester. I've been in the procurement supply chain space for about 20 years, and obviously you can see from the slide I've held a couple of different roles at some large companies in the chemical, oil, and gas space. And to put it in perspective, I'll use some metrics at Lyondell. We were responsible for about $10 billion a year of procurement had a team of roughly 285 people in 19 different countries. And another role that I had was with Accenture, where I was in their supply chain organization. So I've been in this space, and this is where I'm very passionate about this and look forward to this call. Thanks, Rodney. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so we're going to get into um, just kind of a broad overview of, of sourcing and procurement. And I'll have uh, Stephen chime in from time to time as well. Um, 
But when you look at the field of procurement, these are two, you know, broad definitions. I think these speak well to uh, to uh, to the field of procurement. Uh, so you think about purchasing uh, for those that are, you know, that may be brand new to, to this space. Uh, yeah, it is it is the buying activity. That's what most people think of uh, when you think of purchasing. But it goes way beyond that, and, and it's basically the the function of a business. Uh, it includes uh, the aspects of you know identifying what is the gap, what is the problem, um, where is the opportunity, um, conducting that analysis, uh, and and really specking out you know what are you looking for, whether it be making a new product or identifying a new uh, service provider. Uh, it is uh, conducting uh, extensive research on on the supplier, potential suppliers in the marketplace. Uh, it's it's reaching out, it's qualifying those suppliers, it's going through uh, you know the contract negotiations and so forth. Uh, then from there, it turns a little more execution to uh, you know to to the buying activities and and you know purchasing requisitions, purchase orders. Uh, there's obviously the 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 uh, performance management of, of your vendors is very important, making sure they're adhering to service level agreements. And then from there, um, you know, tracking inventory uh, and getting it uh, into, you know, inbound into into the uh, to the destination. Um, they're making sure that the goods and services are procured at the best possible price, and they're 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 factoring in aspects such as the quality, the the quantity or volume. Um, a time is always important, such as you know how fast can you get it here, the the time to fill. Um, you know the location, ge geographical locations come into uh, effect as well. If you're global sourcing, obviously it's going to take a little bit of time to get things uh, back here to the states uh, and so forth. Um, we have seen over the last, I would say, uh, at least 15 plus years, uh, a big focus on 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 the strategic aspects of procurement, uh, looking more at the long-term holistic approach, acquiring the needs of an organization at the lowest total cost of ownership. Uh, and factoring in the different risks that are out there today, everything from tariffs, um, you've got uh, uh, national, national, natural <laughs> disasters and, and things like that, but ultimately creating a, a link. It's between that end customer and the supplier, uh, ensuring that there's continuous improvement as it relates to the quality, uh, the delivery, the cost, the service aspects, uh, while providing the means to achieve optimal efficiencies. Steven, do you want to chime in on on these two definitions uh, from your perspective? I think one one slight uh, caveat that I would add is strategic sourcing sometimes can be an event. So you're you're going to perhaps go to market and and secure supply for a specific need, but it also can can encompass other and I'll use buzzwords, but other things such as category management, supplier relationship management transactional enablement, et cetera. So uh, they're closely intertwined the way they're defined here. Um, it's just important to think that some of these are event-driven or needs-driven and some are ongoing, as you indicate. Right, absolutely, thank you. And when you look at the broader field of procurement, you tend to see things broken out by you know, the direct procurement versus indirect procurement. And so uh, direct procurement is is all of the uh, materials. It can be raw materials. It could be components. If you think about uh, consumer electronics, uh, there's different manufacturers making those components. Same thing with automobiles that are then assembled into a final product, uh, as well as finished goods that are made available for sale to your customers. So that defines uh, direct procurement. Some examples, you know, if you think about the retail industry, it's any product uh, that's made available for purchase by customers. Same thing in wholesale distribution, it's typically purchased out of the customer, may not be an individual, it's it's typically a business. Uh, you look at food manufacturing, all of the different ingredients that are um, that are processed and manufactured into the into the finished good and the packaging. Uh, and so forth. Um, typically, we'll see titles. Uh, titles can be very broad uh, across the space. Um, you know, if you're thinking about you know raw materials or commodities, steel, resins, plastics, things like that, you you see that title commodity or commodities management, uh, procurement, uh, purchasing on the lower end of the spectrum. You might see a buyer title, 
of course, as we talked about in the previous slide, and there are folks that are dedicated more towards the, the sourcing um, uh, aspect of procurement uh, and so forth. <clears throat> Indirect, uh, it's basically the, the activities of sourcing, procuring. Um, you know, typically, it's, it's services or supplies that are needed to support ongoing needs of a business, uh, these are not products that are sold to your customers. And I've listed out some examples here that could be uh, the various types of, of machinery that are used to manufacture uh, different products. Um, you think about all the different um, things. If you're sitting at your desk, uh, everything in front of you, uh, the computers, you know, if you've got a printer, uh, telephone and things like that, well, the power to run those computers, uh, utilities, water, uh, and so forth, and then any type of service provider that you're going to engage to support your uh, company um, as it relates to services such as consulting, uh, if you've got temporary labor needs, your insurances, facilities maintenance, uh, and so forth. And oftentimes you'll see category management referred to uh, the indirect uh, side of procurement um, and, and, you know, services procurement and things like that. Uh, Stephen, anything you want to add on, on these two, two aspects? Now, all I would simply say is, you know, direct, think of cost of goods sold, usually highly specified, usually repetitive purchases, uh, perhaps tied in with your SAP or Oracle type ERP system. Indirect may be a one-off to ongoing repetitive uh, consume, consumed things within the, the back office for your corporation. Exactly. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, and and you'll, see, you'll see different types of uh, of processes or frameworks that are put into place um, that kind of define the different stages. Um, and we touched on this earlier, uh, everything, you know, typically there's some kind of a need that, that's driving this action, or Stephen mentioned, like an event. Um, and you could see everything from uh, whether it be a new product development, you, maybe you've got a supplier that's having capacity issues. Uh, obviously, we've got tariffs, you know, the trade war that's ongoing, that's creating a lot of uh, of uh, panic, but also that, that's, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity um, as it relates to an uptick in hiring and folks that are looking for, you know, global sourcing, strategic sourcing expertise. But really, you know, what is the need and, and defining that and scoping it out um, and then really assessing what are, what are the supplier, who are the suppliers, who are the best suppliers that are out there, uh, collecting their information. You'll hear the term request for information is typically sent out to these suppliers uh, to, to get a good sense of, uh, of their capabilities. Um, and then from there, it's really developing um, that sourcing strategy, defining what you're wanting out of that supplier and the terms, uh, the pricing and all of those good things. Uh, and then from there, it kind of moves on into the execution phase of, uh, of like getting the contract signed, onboarding that supplier and slowly and, uh, and surely uh, ramping them up and, and so forth. Um, Stephen, what have you seen in, in uh, when you, you know when you think about the process? Uh, I know in your industry, you know, you've been in chemicals, oil, and gas, and I'm sure that's a very um, probably a lot different than some of the industries that I tend to focus on with CPG and retail and so forth. <clears throat> so, I, I guess some of the differences that I've seen is uh, steps one, two, and three are typically extremely analytically uh, oriented. Uh, sometimes the information is readily available. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes it can be in multiple systems or multiple people have, a, have a, an ability to provide input into the needs. And crafting the the, the baseline and understanding the baseline so that you can craft your strategy there in, in step four and step five are, are paramount. This is where a procurement professional, a strategic sourcing professional can absolutely make or break their contribution to the effort is doing an excellent job in steps one, two, and three. And as you go through the rest of the process, I've used some some different words, but uh, in different step numbering. But it it really the the hard work also starts after step six and step seven. 
especially if you're changing out an incumbent supplier to multiple other suppliers where you're having to change your supply chain, getting them on board, getting them uh, able to transact, making sure the contract is robust, and making sure that the team stakeholders inside the company are prepared and know how to uh, handle this new supplier, it's very critical, especially in the world of services or highly engineered equipment and components that may be part of your cost of goods sold. Rodney? Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. So now that we've kind of taken a look at, you know, the broader definitions and, um, you know, kind of a typical sourcing process, um, you know, I'd like to kind of get into the meat of the discussion, which is going to be around, you know, skills needed and, you know, what the career paths look like and entail, and then, you know, talk about some of the different nuances that you'll uh, find, you know, from, from industry to industry. So with that said, you know, looking at the core skills and competencies and, um, you know, I'm sure there's, a, you could build a longer list than this. Uh, Stephen and I were on the phone yesterday kind of going through some of these, um, but, you know, attention to detail is is critical and in a role like this, as you can imagine, you're handling the, 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 the basically the financial spend and, procurement of of services and, and as Stephen mentioned the number he threw out that he ha that he managed for his large team there that was very global was uh, well into the billions and and a lot of the companies that I've recruited for internally you know with Coke and Kimberly Clark and, and they were all in the billions too and so uh, you, you can't let a, a couple of zeros slip up you know on, on that end and um, so you have to be attention to detail especially when it relates to contracting um, even on our end we send out a lot of service agreements and you know, very easy to, to make a little mistake. So attention to detail is, is extremely important. Uh, obviously, uh, relationship building, and when you think about that, it's, it's critical both internally uh, and externally. Uh, you, you are essentially um, you know, a business partner to, to your internal stakeholder, stakeholders. So if you're supporting manufacturing, you, know, you really need to understand um, the ins and outs of, of that side of the business, um, you know, if you're supporting marketing, uh, which which I did at Coca-Cola, you know, obviously one of the top branding branding brand companies out there, um, you know, they they spend a lot of money on agencies and collateral commercials and things like that. So you have to really understand whoever um, you're assigned to support um, and, and build those relationships and, and be viewed as an advisory uh, type of partner. Uh, solving problems is is uh, is critical. That's what a, a lot of procurement professionals do. Hey, we want to build this design, this new widget, and um, you know, well, oftentimes uh, the procurement folks are the ones, kind of the heroes, that go out and find you know the right parts or components or raw materials to really bring that product to life. Uh, communication is critical, uh, especially when you're working with a lot of suppliers. So uh, we talked about the importance of, of internal relationship building and communicating to stakeholders. Uh, you've got to be able to do that externally as well. And uh, and it comes to, and when you think about managing that supplier performance, that's critical. It's it's very important to let them know how well they're doing and and where they're falling short. Uh, typically assigned to SLAs within the contracts and the, of course the metrics or dashboard reporting that um, scorecards, uh, whatever tactic you're using to kind of manage your performance and making sure you're communicating and being proactive versus reactive. Uh, clearly, you know, when you're negotiating terms, uh, conditions, uh, pricing, uh, you, you have to be a strong negotiator, always have a plan B and a plan C and, and things like that. And, you know, my day of uh, growing up in this uh, of supply chain recruitment, you know, working with some of the behemoths in retail, um, you know, in the old days, a lot of times it was that top down, hammer down approach where, you know, you do as I say, you know, we're the large retailer and, you know, we're starting to, we've seen a, a kind of a trend where that doesn't always work effectively. So building those partnerships uh, is critical, looking for the win-win, you know, the long term and so forth, uh, being able to analyze lots of data is important, especially if you're trying to, you, know, you think about, oh, you're purchasing a product and you're getting it from China, it's not the cost of the product, it is that total cost of ownership of getting it, um, you know, from the supplier, uh, it, you know, into the final destination. So you have to be good at that. Strategical thinking is, is critical. Critical thinking is important as well. Uh, being able to manage your time and, and uh, you know, stay on task with projects is also very important. 
and then you know influencing decision decisions with uh, you know key stakeholders is critical. Uh, as Stephen mentioned earlier, a lot of the difficult work starts when you're you know you're you're bringing on a new supplier. So being able to lead the company through that change and helping that supplier be sex successful is also critical. And obviously, when you're uh, you're spending money, the company's money, you need to really understand those financial levers and so forth. Um, Stephen, turn it over to you. Anything you wanted to add in terms of uh, or uh, these skills and competencies that I miss anything? No, I think these are these are good. I think on the communication skill set, I, I would just underscore that 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 is so critical, and it's it's not only how you share information, it's how you listen and receive information. And keeping in mind, we're moving more and more into a global supply community. You have perhaps manufacturing or consumption going on in different regions of the world, different measurement systems, different cultural norms. It is so important that you're an effective communicator. And I mean that in, in both directions. I would, uh, I would really underscore that one. Absolutely. And understanding the different cultural differences in, in other parts of the world is, is very uh, important. We worked with a company uh, based out of Switzerland and we were for a strategic sourcing manager and we went through some candidates and, and they, they actually used some different terminology than we use. We were talking about the same thing using different terms and he was thinking, well, this person's way off. And then finally we just realized that uh, just slightly different terms over there that can, that can make or break uh, um, the communication. So you have to understand those dynamics as well. Uh, so, you know, in our firm, SCM Talent Group, we, we do work with a, a number of industries. We, we mainly focus on shippers. That's a, that's a broad area in itself with companies that do manufacturing, uh, retail, wholesale, so, you know, product-centric companies. Um, and when you think about procurement and how things differ, um, you know, it can be it can be drastic between these industri industries. So you, you look at manufacturing, um, you know, obviously it's uh, heavily focused on, on producing uh, that finished good typically. Uh, everything from you know, raw materials, ingredients, uh, we talked about consumer electronics, automotive companies are a little different. They've got you know, tier one, tier two uh, suppliers that are manufacturing everything uh, <clears throat> from the, you know, the body of the vehicle, the transmission and, and so forth, the engines, and then they do the final assembly. Uh, you've got uh, a whole other side of, of manufacturing that's outsourced to contract manufacturers. Uh, you've got co-packers that may be involved with certain elements of that, uh, doing that final package assembly. Uh, you've got uh, the need to procure capital equipment and machinery, uh, MROs, maintenance, um, repair and operations. So all of the different tools, uh, lubricants, whatever it might be that uh, is needed to, to keep those production lines uh, running effectively and well-maintained. Um, those are just some of the core things you find in, in most manufacturing uh, industries. And of course, we do work with a lot of small, mid-sized companies. Uh, they may not have the capital to go out and, and, and set up their own um, manufacturing operations. Uh, and they're very expensive, obviously. So a lot of times they're working with suppliers to you know, procure those finished goods. And then they get in, you know, helping, you know, partnering with them on, on developing new products, expanding their capabilities and things of that nature. Uh, when you when you flip it over to, to retail, it's it's uh, you know you think about going into you know really any retail store. What you it's not just about you know the buying and selling of products. Uh, it's it's the assortment that is carried within the stores versus what might you might find online. It can vary drastically. There is a visual element, visual merchandising. Um, you think about you're walking into a, a grocery store, maybe you're looking for a six pack of beer. Uh, that product placement is so critical uh, and, and you know what where your eyes kind of meet the shelf and there's a lot of competition for that coveted space versus the bottom of the shelf and so forth. So there's a lot of factors that go in um, you know to that visual element, you know what you might find on the end cap. and then you you know typically see a lot of seasonality when you think about you know Home Depot spring season. They're going to be carrying different items at that time of year versus the winter, um, and that also applies to different parts of of uh, the country or even the globe. Um, 
you know, people out in Arizona aren't going to need snow shovels, uh, for example. Um, and there's oftentimes promotions and discounts, especially as you're bringing on new um, upgrades to new products and, and things like that. Wholesale distribution is, you know, is heavily relying on finished goods procurement. Uh, a lot of these can be everything from your lower, your common commodities uh, to, to integrated solutions working with a new uh, global uh, fastener uh, distributor right now. They have an integrated uh, supply chain solutions department where they will you know, partner and actually have people sitting at uh, some of their clients' operations, uh, you know, like an automotive, for example, uh, helping carry out some of the procurement uh, responsibilities. <clears throat> Healthcare like, drastically varies you know, across hospitals, uh, medical device, pharmaceutical, and so forth. Hospital needs are going to be very different than which you would find that goes into the manufacturing of a, a pharmaceutical uh, or uh, or medical device. Uh, same thing when you look at hotels, hot restaurants, hospitality. Uh, you just if you walk into a hotel, you can clearly see. You know, you know that there's going to be furniture in the in the rooms. Uh, you think about the entertainment. Uh, we had a call from a large uh, hotel chain in uh, Las Vegas, and uh, just. The, the things that you have to procure, the entertainment, the fixtures, uh, that again, that was, you know, billions of spend. So, the, so those categories can really vary um, uh, within that industry. Oil and gas, Stephen, anything you want to comment on that? Because uh, that's one industry we don't do a whole lot with. Sure. It, you know, first of all, it's, it, it's global. It, uh, it's, I, I'm guessing there's probably a trillion dollars of, uh, of spend. Uh, on, uh, across the globe in oil, gas, upstream, downstream, chemicals, utilities, that's everything from lights, uh, electricity, water, power to uh, steam, uh, et cetera, other, other things that are um, available in there. And you have companies that play in all elements of this business. So uh, you can, you can be responsible for procuring equipment, services on a large basis or just in one small geography. And so it's, uh, it's, it's important to understand the difference. It's very technical. Uh, there's many differences around the world in, 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 in the sense of uh, American Petroleum Institute specifications versus uh, what Europe may have in place or even Asia. So those are the kinds of things that you have to be excited about and willing and able to learn um, uh, the the technical elements of what you're procuring in you know, at least the oil and gas space. Absolutely. And then the next three, uh, you know, you look at if you need a service provider, you need a recruiting company like what we do. Um, you know, you need temp labor to supplement your your baseline staff within whether it's your you know your factory or a distribution center. Um, it, the, the, those procurement roles are, are going to vary, you know, heavily on the indirect side. Uh, you look at technology companies, from consumer electronics to software companies. Uh, very, very, very different needs there. Um, you know, compared to you know manufacturing, obviously. Uh, then you get into things like cons you know consulting, which I would lump under service providers. Uh, again, heavily, heavily on the indirect procurement side, making sure that they have the right, everything from the right equipment to the right technology partners um, and, and so forth. Um, can't cover all industries, but I hope this gives you a good idea of, of, how, of how procurement, you know, really difference in terms of the types of, you know, whether it's a products or services uh, and so forth. Um, anything you want to add, Steve, Stephen? I'm good. Okay, great. Uh, Quickly, we'll go through just some of the titles that you might find and then how the levels of responsibilities. Um, now, th this is going to vary drastically from company to company. I think it's important to point out, and as Stephen and I were talking about this yesterday, that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, company size is a huge factor as well. It, and as we're working with clients, um, you know, if they're working with a small, mid-sized client where, they're looking for somebody to do source and procurement. It's, it's typically going to be, you know, broad in nature. It could be handling multiple types of categories. It could be tan it could be handling everything there is to do with with procurement. You're you're it. You're the you're the guy. And when you start scaling up to companies that are more global and um, more complex, um, with more spend and more suppliers, 
you will typically find uh, that there's a lot of segmentation, a lot of specialists and subject matter experts. Um, so you have to factor that in as you're, as you're looking at careers. Uh, smaller companies, you might get some exposure to broader categories uh, and commodities, um, larger companies. You know, sometimes, um, you know, you can, I don't want to say the word pigeonhole, but, you know, if you spend several years where all you're doing is procuring, let's say, 3PL services, uh, you're going to gain that expertise and reputation in the company. And sometimes it can be a bit challenging to, to move into different areas. So, so just bear that in mind. Uh, now on the flip side, you're going to get some enormous amount of training and exposure when, when you're with the larger uh, global organizations as well, and probably a lot more access to career opportunities too in terms of advancement. So with that said, uh, when you're starting out, you know, one of the more common titles that we find is, you know, you're looking at, you know, a buyer. Uh, this is more of a tactical role and, and you're doing a lot of the execution work in terms of placing orders and and things like that, um, sometimes involved, you know, with doing, you know, the, the analytical, uh, digging through data, um, it, it, a lot of administrative work as well can be can be expected in, in these types of roles. Um, you know, also getting involved with doing research with, you know, what, the, what are the suppliers that are out there, uh, compiling reports, uh, things of that nature. Anything else you want to add on that level or tier, Stephen? No, just there's there's no one standard. Uh, every industry has its own uh, set of job descriptions and career paths. And I guess one thing I would I would point out is uh, expect to do laterals as you as you grow to get breadth and depth across any procurement uh, strategic sourcing organization. That's a great point. And clearly, as you advance in experience and, and you're adding value, uh, contributing to your employer, um, as Stephen mentioned, you know, you, you're going to uh, typically be assigned, you know, larger um, projects, uh, responsibilities. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can kind of see that, you know, ultimately, if you're looking to be uh, a VP of procurement or or like Stephen has been a chief procurement officer for several years now. Uh, those roles are, are big impacts on the organization, and you're you know managing obviously typically a lot of people, a lot of spend, a lot of suppliers, and, and you're really going to be viewed as that leader within the organization um, uh, that's ultimately responsible for uh, for the acquisition programs. <clears throat> okay, we're going to just quickly go through some of the challenges and trends. I will lean on Stephen heavily in this area because I know he's, these are things that he's been facing uh, in his roles. Uh, so obviously you can't open up um, the, the news without you know hearing about what's going on with trade wars and tariffs. And um, so a lot of companies right now are, are scrambling. Um, you know, obviously tariffs can, can, uh, can Add on to the price, and you know companies have to make that determination of whether they absorb it or pass it on to their consumers. We've we've been uh, following this trend extensively on our end. Uh, we are getting, like I said, an up, up, uptick in, in requests for help as it relates to helping our clients finding you know uh, strategic sourcing, global sourcing professionals, um, especially those that are really um, I would call it putting your Supplier eggs in, in one basket, and uh, if you're in certain areas in China, you know where the tariffs have been impacted, it can it can certainly um, um, impact your margins and uh, and and create some serious issues with your business. Uh, so I think uh, ultimately it's important. You know, there's really no one solution. It's hard to plan for the unexpected, but uh, it is important to have the right uh, sourcing and procurement professionals in place that can work on. Um, you know, diversifying the supplier base and, and other solutions to help mitigate those risks. Have you, what have you been seeing on your end, Stephen? Well, I think if you think about China, if you think about Brexit and the separation from the EU, you know, you, part of strategic sourcing is you have to do scenario planning. You have to understand your contingencies. You have to understand you don't always want the lowest cost because if that supplier is removed for for any particular reason you can have a, a severe problem so i will say everyone thinks everything is uh, smooth around the world and then something happens and it can certainly uh, take you take you off base so you must scenario plan 
That's right. Contingency planning is, is critical. Okay. Uh, here are some of the trends that uh, have been going on in procurement and supply chain, of course. Um, you know, digitalization is is important. I know, uh, Stephen, you mentioned we talked yesterday that you know deploying solutions around Internet of Things has been something that you've done in your um, in your past. Is anything you want to highlight there? Sure. Just the fact that the I think digital and transformation, e-procurement, those things, I'll, I'll say they all kind of touch one another. The computing power that's becoming readily available, the sophistication of artificial intelligence, the, the uh, explosion in terms of expectation in, of, of what companies are going to be asked to do. It's starting with the board of directors. It's starting with the CEOs. It's starting with the department heads. And you've, you're going to have to work in that space. So you're, I think change and, and that transformation there from second from the bottom, I think that's now a constant. Um, gone are the days of I think you implement one thing and, and you kind of rest on your laurels. I think transformation and agility are going to be the new way of doing things. And those trends are not just common in procurement, but I think we're seeing it there first because we use technology to communicate with our suppliers, to transact with them. It's, it's global, so you certainly want the lowest cost, and if, if technology or digital can help you do that, you, you're gonna go find it, and it moves very quickly. High volume transactions, um, high volume service providers, it forces the need to, to juggle these trends quickly at, at pretty much every level, from buyer all the way through CPO. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. All right. So that covers some of the trends. So, you know, it's not going to go have time to really go through each and every one of those in detail, but uh, it's in, just important to know you work in procurement. It, it change is constant, and you know you have to be adaptable. I think one of the things we tend to hear out in the uh, workforce um, when you look at the skill, we talked about the skills needed. Those are those are the core skills, but you know, one thing we didn't really touch on is is that ability to adapt and adapt to the the changing landscape, the geopolitical issues, um, the risk management and mis and mitigation, uh, these advancing technologies. That's it's it's critical to try to embrace and learn and learn these new tools and skill set because that's what can create a competitive advantage and keep your company afloat, especially in difficult times. Uh, so now we want to turn it over to uh, a quick uh, panelist discussion with Stephen. And again, we appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with the ASCM uh, members on our Career Coach webinar. I've um, just got a few questions I want to throw out at Stephen. And, um, you know, I think the ability for him to kind of, you know, share some of his stories and where he started and how he got to the, you know, the CPO level. A lot of folks get there, but it's just like the pyramid. You think about you know, those uh, the senior executive roles, there's definitely not as many of those uh, that are floating around. And so he's going to kind of give us a, a overview of the steps he took to get there and challenges he faced and things of that nature. Uh, so, Stephen, uh, so question one, you know, from a high level, could you just break down your career journey um, and, you know, where you started and how you got to where you're at today? Sure, happy to. So for the last 22 years, I've been in procurement and supply chain my entire entire career. Started off with uh, Accenture, which was Anderson Consulting, and and I will say working in a consulting company is phenomenal because you get to see multiple clients, multiple categories, many problems come at you fast, so you get to hone your skill set. Um, from there, I went to work in operating companies again: ConocoPhillips, Smith, Schlumberger, Lyondell, so. That is also extremely rewarding because you're having to actually implement what you what you uh, what you strategized about during a sourcing activity, and then you have to you have to implement it. So um, the career journey for me kind of went from being a an individual contributor to a small team leader and do a couple laterals there uh, to a manager of of a decent sized group. Uh, one was regional, and then it became global. Uh, working multiple categories, dozens and dozens of different categories, and then I have the last couple of roles that had a CPO, 
have been, you know, really building and transforming procurement organizations. And that takes on everything from uh, building a talent and, and bench to improving the technology that we use to transact to planning for the future, whether it be mergers and acquisitions, Brexit, trade with China, et cetera. So that's just a brief summary of, of, a, of a typical career journey of a chief procurement officer. Excellent. Thank you. And in your opinion, and I think this is, you know, with, with our audience on the call today, you know, everybody's looking for those uh, those tidbits and those nuggets of wisdom and advice. What are some things we can do, they can do differently to really put themselves ahead to make them more marketable, um, to be in a position to to reach those uh, those higher level roles. So in your opinion, what are some of the keys to success with, as it relates to advancing a career in procurement? Sure. And it goes back to the skill set we, we spoke of early, Rodney, um, you know, communication. So I, I call it do the job. You've got to be curious. You've got to ask questions. You have to listen. You have to learn. You've got to work hard to understand the nature of the category or categories. You have to understand your stakeholders and how it relates to the business that they're responsible for, how it plays a role within your company. So just just do your job. And, and I know that seems simple and easy, but I, I believe in my experience, having worked in both, I think in procurement, it's it's not as well defined as it is in some cases in the normal supply chain manufacturing world. So I would say you've, you've just got to constantly be thinking and and doing more. Um, and, and one, I guess, small piece of advice that I would share is, um, you know, lots of people approach me and say, hey, I, I would love to be chief procurement officer. And, and I always tell them, I said, you know, two things. Number one, don't do it. Don't do it because it pays more. Um, and I know that sounds a little brash, but uh, it, it's managing people is a huge commitment and you have to make sure you're good at it. Um, in my particular case, in the last two companies, I had subject matter experts that were individual contributors that were highly technical engineered um, experts in, the, in their space, had 30 year careers and, and they recognized they didn't want to be the leader of the function or leader of a group. They wanted to keep leading their category. So, I guess a, a piece of advice, and it's free here, is is really really know yourself. Do a lot of self awareness and self introspection, and know what your strengths are, and and play to those in the procurement space. Good stuff. What about some of the challenges that you faced, um, you know, Stephen? What are what are some of the big ones that you can recall, um, and then how? You know, what are some things you did to overcome overcome those challenges? Sure. So I, there's there's kind of three that I guess I'll, I'll hit on real quick. One, you're always going to have to build a relationship with stakeholders. We, we talked about it. It was kind of step one of your sourcing process. You're going to have to, to work with stakeholders that may not want to change. Their mission may not be to book savings. Their mission may be, hey, don't upset the apple cart, so to speak. So... So you're going to have to work with stakeholders, and, and to overcome that, you've got to really uh, put yourself out there, and you have to do a lot to prepare to have that conversation. Um, the second thing is, as a departmental leader, you have to really enhance employee engagement. Um, the last two companies I've gone into, we've, we've done surveys. You, you wouldn't believe how a, a disengaged staff base, it, it, it can hurt you. Uh, within the department. So you've got to really engage employees. And the way I do that is you've got to care about them. You have to invest in them and they have to see that and believe it. And then they'll start, uh, I'll say, performing. And last but not least, you have to invest in yourself continuously. You know, I've, I've, I've been in roles where, you know, I've, I've been fired before because I pushed back too hard and I have to be okay with that. Um, but because I'm continuously learning and learning what's going on, what trends exist, what technology exists. I'm able to uh, appeal to perhaps a new employer um, as that opportunity comes up. Great. Okay. Last question. Uh, what advice would you give? And I know you've already touched on this a little bit, um, but is there any additional sure. advice you would want to provide to help, you know, budding uh, people getting into this space 
uh, let's say at the at the very beginning, their first jobs to really help that those individuals advance their careers. So I, I mentioned communicate, communicating, communication, listening, and, and learning, uh, interpersonal skills to have that impact and influence. Um, you know, if, if you're not interested in selling something, think about it in procurement. You're selling an idea, so you know you're going to have to you're going to have to build up uh, those those skill sets, and that's necessary to advance your career. I would say, you know, be open to um, different roles and, and different jobs, even within the same company, within the procurement domain. Um, and I always tell people, take the messy job, not the sexy one. Uh, everybody wants to do strategic sourcing. It, it, it's the new buzz thing. It's, it's very popular, that and digital. But I'll tell you, I've had the opportunity to uh, work both simple and complex categories. I've worked materials and services. Uh, I've had to figure out procure to pay processes. I've had the the opportunity to to implement SAP or Reba. Um, so again, you know, while sourcing and strategic sourcing is is sexy, um, it, it's it's somewhat easy relative to the other hard parts: implementing a contract, understanding terms and conditions, mapping the transactional processes all the way through to the end. So, um, I guess a, in in closing, a piece of advice is. You know, be willing to take that messy job that no one else wants to do to learn because it will make you a more effective procurement leader down the road. Absolutely. 100% agree. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. So uh, we've got a couple of announcements. Um, Dana, are you going to want to talk about these? Uh, yeah, I'll run through them okay. real quick, Rodney, if you want to advance through the slides. Great. So while I go over this, um, you can all start typing in your questions into the questions box. Um, so uh, in light of today's topic, if you are planning on attending ASEM 2019 in Las Vegas this September, we will be presenting several sessions related to the topic of procurement and sourcing. For a full list of conference sessions and information on how to register, please visit ASEM.org. Okay, Rodney? Okay. Great. Um, and also, we have a virtual career fair coming up in October. This will take place on the 23rd from noon to 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The virtual career fair takes place entirely online, so you can connect with employers from the comfort of your home or office. Last year, the career fair featured top companies like Boeing, Johnson & Johnson, and Comcast, so don't miss out. Most importantly, this event is free for ASCM members. You'll receive an email in the next few weeks with some more information on how to register. These are just a few of the great benefits that ASCM offers. If you'd like to read more about them, you can visit ASCM.org and click on Membership and Community. Okay, and let's go to questions here. Uh, let's see. This one relates to oil and gas. In an upstream oil and gas field, how can we differentiate direct procurement from the indirect one? So maybe I'll I'll take that one. So you know it depends on. Pardon? Yeah. Okay. It depends on how literal you get in terms of the the direct and indirect. So if you majority of upstream oiling for hydrocarbons, be it oil or or gas, usually those are both produced together. Um, that's in the ground. Uh, you know, Mother Nature created that over millions of years. And, and that, at the end of the day, is what the companies are going to use to make refined products. Um, and so if you think about that, that is the direct end material. You're, you're not really procuring that um, other than buying the, the, light, the, the license or right to, to drill or produce in that particular domain. Um, <clears throat> what is very common, though, is to, to get hydrocarbons out of the ground, it's extremely capital intensive. So... You have a drill rig. You have to you have to uh, use pipe to go down into the earth. You then pull that oil and gas out. You have to separate it. Lots of water and many chemicals go into that to actually get it all the way down to a hydrocarbon that you can take and turn into, let's say, gasoline or into a into a plastic uh, input raw material. So, um, in in that particular case, Dana, I would say that. The direct material is the hydrocarbon that's coming from, again, the earth, uh, but there's also a whole lot of materials and services that are absolutely required 
to to produce it, and they're, they're part of cost of goods sold. Thank you, Stephen. Very fascinating. Uh, let's see. One question. Oops, sorry, they're coming in so fast. It's hard to read them. Um, with the popularity of AI and IoT, will procurement still exist in the next 10 to 15 years? I, maybe I'll answer this and then Rodney jump in. I, I, I believe a trend that we're seeing more of is a, an end-to-end -end chief commercial officer where someone has to understand what do our customers want, how do we make it or manufacture it or provide that service, and what input, direct and indirect materials do we need. Um, I think we'll always most industries will always need to buy something from someone and then do their value add to it or, or change it with the service to deliver it. Um, so whether the title chief procurement officer or chief supply chain officer exists, um, I don't think AI or Internet of Things are going to eliminate it. I think they are accelerating the speed with which uh, decisions, information, uh, alternatives, and choices are are being made available. Great, thank you. Why do several industries not feel that the skills from one industry are transferable to another industry? In your view, I can probably take that one. Uh, that you know, there. I think a lot of times it comes down to uh, employers. You know, if if they if they have their drive, you know, they're always going to um, have those, they're always going to try to find candidates uh, that, that meet the, let's call it the preferred requirements. And, uh, you know, when you look at the activities uh, involved uh, from, like, let's just say, for example, retail versus manufacturing, um, it, it, is, it is very, very different um, in terms of that skill set that's required. While there are a lot of similarities, of course, uh, I do feel like employers are 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 all, you know, typically going to lean towards candidates that that have those that that industry experience. Um, the main reason is is because they they tend to hit the ground running a bit faster and can get up to speed quicker. Uh, so that's typically what we see. Um, and I think if you're a candidate wanting to switch industries, well, first of all, we've covered this topic a couple of times in past webinars. So I would definitely refer, if that's something you're looking to do is transition from one industry to another, we, we've, I've got into some pretty good tactics of, of how to do that. And a lot of it does come down to networking and building relationships uh, inside of uh, those targeted companies in, in whatever industry you're looking at to move into. Um, so that's kind of what, what I see in the recruiting world, and, and it, it applies not just in sourcing procurement, but really um, all aspects. Uh, now, um, you know, especially when you look at, now on the indirect side, let's talk about that. Uh, that's where we tend to see a, little, a, a, a lot more leniency. You know, if you're procuring IT equipment services uh, in one company, you know, you can certainly do it in, in, in another. A lot of times that will come down to the size, scale, complexity of those companies and their needs, geographical uh, presence and so forth. Um, anything to add on that, Stephen? No, I, I agree. We frequently will hire the indirect category managers um, and we'll just offer them perhaps a, a, a larger spend or, or a larger scope, which excites them, um, gives them a chance to grow, or we might put several indirects together. But typically on the direct side, it's usually industry-centric, and that's what we're kind of paying for. Exactly. And then you also have just the experience with the knowledge of, of the supplier bases. You, know where, you tend to know where to find them. And you've got that familiarity with whatever those direct commodities are, um, you know, from specifications and, and things like that, how they're made, the processing involved, and so forth. And that's typically why they look for people that have uh, have that 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 experience. Great. I think we have time for one last question. Looks like a few of our listeners are really interested if there is. Any type of specific resources you read to stay up to date on the industry and trends and latest technology? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then pass it over to Steven. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big reader, but 
and I do read books uh, quite a bit, but I tend to be to stay on top of, of trends. Um, I'm I'm reading a lot of uh, blog posts and, and trade journals is where I spend most of my reading time. And I'm going to give you so, uh, the name of a tool that I use to keep all of that stuff together in one place. It's called Feedly, F-E-E-D-L-Y dot com. And um, I don't know if, if, if you – it's Google had a news reader. Uh, they shelved it, and then Feedly came in and swooped right in, and, and they created a migration, and, and it's free. They have a paid tool, which we use here for sharing content on social media and so forth. But you can go in there and put in, start with keywords. Uh, you can even put in hashtags, and it'll it'll start recommending sources. Of, say, let's say you're looking for a procurement, uh, a procurement related blog. Uh, there's a number of them, a number of supply chain blogs. I mean, dozens and dozens of them, and I've got all of them. Um, I've subscribed to every one of them, and I've got, and you can set up uh, categories for your feed. So if you've got something like that's on strictly on sourcing or procurement, or maybe you want to know about an industry. Let's call it oil and gas. Um, you know, there's there's always multiple blogs out there um, on on any of those industries or functions, and I think it's just a, a great way to keep a strong pulse on what's going on within those industries or, or fields and whatnot. And that's that's how I personally keep up with trends. So what about you, Stephen? So some of the things that I do, you know, certainly reading and and the blogs. Um, I get a lot of my information from uh, Hackett, which is a, a company that specializes in the procurement supply chain space. I also get information, surprisingly, from recruiting companies. Um, some of the, the huge companies have uh, points of view or perspectives that they publish, and the reason they do that is it's a way for them to drum up business. And then some of the very best sources, and, and I happen to be an alumni, but is a company like Accenture or Deloitte or uh, you know any of the large advisory consulting companies? A lot of them have perspectives out there. Again, they, it's their marketing and branding information and material, and a lot of it is for free. It's very generic and high level, usually not industry specific, although they may have that as well. And I have found if you dig in and poke around their website, you can get a tremendous amount of information on what is kind of cutting edge and and then you you can go from there, and many of them will meet with you and, and talk to you about it if you're if you're indicating an interest, and in, and they might see a business opportunity down the road. Great, thank you. Looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. I apologize we weren't able to get too many more. Uh, I'd like to thank our speaker Rodney Apple and guest Stephen Hester for their time today, and to all of our attendees for sticking with us through our little hiccups at the beginning of our broadcast. We hope that you found this webinar to be beneficial. Please be sure to keep an eye out for future webinars on the online events page of the ASM website. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.